Good morning. Would you please introduce yourself? Good morning. My name is Rick Marshall. I'm the founder of the Vista Expertise Network. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your role in Vista, the work that you've been doing, oh. the work you have done. God help us. Uh, so I've, this has been my entire career. I, uh, I've been doing Vista for 27 years. I was hired one week after I graduated from high school in June of 1984, <coughs> looking for a summer job. And uh, by sheer coincidence, uh, the Walla Walla VA Hospital, I graduated Walla Walla High School, the Walla Walla VA Hospital had just been shipped their first test version of DHCP, what would later become Vista. They hadn't even opened the box yet. They didn't know what to do with it. And that was the day I arrived to see if I could get a job. Um, so it wasn't anything technical. Could I help them open the box? Could I help them label the tapes? Could I make a backup? And I had a minimal computer background. I could do that much. And so, yeah, I got hired as a summer aide. And well, here I am. So <coughs> one thing leads to another. Um, during that time, I've worked, I worked for the VA for 19 years, uh, up through 2003. 12 of those years in the middle were national development, working on uh, the kernel and file manager packages. Um, the remaining years were worked at the Walla Walla VA one year, Seattle VA the rest of the years. And I was always, after Walla Walla, I was always physically located at the Seattle VA up on Beacon Hill in Seattle, um, working as a satellite from the San Francisco National Development Office. So <clears throat> I started as a programmer, quickly got into teaching and writing, and then um, technical strategy, then team leading, then, you know, then one thing leads to another. It's one of those kind of things. Um, by 2001, it was clear to us that the world outside of the VA needed, um, needed help with Vista. It was, you know, many of these community hospitals couldn't afford the commercial software. So, um, but they also couldn't install Vista on their own because it was too complex. The VA had not designed Vista to be easy to install. All the installations had happened back in the early 80s. They hadn't been working on them since. So, <coughs> we wanted to... Um, form a nonprofit that would help people to adopt Vista successfully and plug them into the network of experts that are out there in the world. Uh, so we started, we started um, the World Vista efforts in 2001. By 2002 or three, we were incorporated. In 2003, I left the VA because it was clear to me that for World Vista to thrive, somebody had to work on it full time. So, uh, so that was me. And uh, I stayed with World Vista until December of 2006 when I left to form the Vista Expertise Network. I wanted to form a more hands-on nonprofit to be a, um, a companion to World Vista. World Vista was focused on community building and being the center of the community. Uh, the network, <coughs> what, what, what we needed was um, somebody to actually physically work with the hospitals. And part of it is for the reasons I gave in my talk yesterday, to, to make sure that our efforts were guided by uh, the users, that we, were, that we were in harness and the users were driving us because that's the reality principle that makes sure that our work is relevant. So I, I formed the network in, uh, in 2007 after leaving World Vista and uh, since then we've worked with Indian Health Service, OSERA, and, but, but mainly Oroville Hospital helping them to, to bring up their Vista system. So this is what I do. Yes. <clears throat> well, that, that's the question in a nutshell, isn't it? Um, ironically, for the first half of our, my career, I didn't have any idea there was anything special about Vista. I assumed everybody, all hospitals, must have something like a Vista. They must all write their own software and customize it to do what they needed, and it was just what you do. It was just work. Um, it wasn't until the 90s that I began to realize, and many of us began to realize, that, um, that Vista was special. And the, the funny thing is, <clears throat> we were the second generation. You know, there'd been the underground, the first generation. They knew exactly what Vista was. They, you know, they fought for it, and they, they lost jobs for it, and uh, they, they knew how unusual it was. But the second generation, there'd been a, a decapitation of leadership. Uh, Ted O'Neill, Marty Johnson, Henry Heffern, they were gone. And the people managing Vista inside the VA um, hadn't been part of the underground movement. So they didn't pass on to us the information that we were dealing with this special legacy. We had no idea. It wasn't until the 90s when, um, when the VA began trying to replace Vista. 
And we were all depressed. We were like, oh, well, there goes our work. That's all we thought of it as. There goes our work. <coughs> and uh, they couldn't. They kept trying and failing. They kept spending huge amounts of money and nothing would happen. And so we began to get curious. Why, why are we still here? <laughs> why, haven't, why haven't we been booted out? Why, why is Vista still around? And that was when we began to realize that it was a unique. There was really nothing else at that scale like it. The only other massive EHR systems were commercial proprietary and closed source. And that's when we began, the second generation began to catch up and develop the theories to match what the first generation had already realized in the very beginning, which is why you have to do it this way, why it's important, and why Vista in particular um, needs special attention because uh, it's, a, it's a unique legacy that by existing not only helps to save lives and improve patient care, but also proves what can happen if people take their software and their information into their own hands. So that, that had to continue. So we, we realized it could change the world. You mentioned uh, that they were trying to replace this with proprietary and closed systems. Yes. Why is it important that Vista is open? <coughs> So a couple of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that no two hospitals practice medicine the same way. They can't. Uh, they're different. They serve different populations. They're in different states. They're under different laws. They're in different countries under different laws with different traditions. Um, medicine is a craft. That's why doctors practice it instead of execute it. It's, 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 not, a, it's not a mechanical discipline. And that means the software has to be extraordinarily adaptive to local circumstances. Um, if you write one <coughs> set of software with, uh, for, for an EHR with one set of features, you, what you've created is what we call one size fits none. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, if you develop it at a hospital driven by that hospital's users, you'll manage to achieve one size fits one. But you know, if, you, if you do the normal thing and have your developers in an office somewhere away from a hospital, you'll create one size fits none. Even Vista is one size fits none, but it's tailorable and adjustable and extensible to an extent that most software just can't even imagine being. Why would anybody do that? Well, we do that because every instance of Vista at every hospital in the world is different. And it's, 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 it's um, bespoke software. You know, it's custom tailored to fit what that hospital needs. And furthermore, constantly updating and changing as the hospital's needs change and update. So um, that's, that's actually the main reason I said, I said I was going to do two, but that, that really covers it. I mean, that's, that's the fundamental reason why, uh, why it has to be. No, I remember the second reason. The second reason is um, medicine, good medicine, is evidence-based. You know, it's, not, it's not the authorities from on high say, you will practice medicine this way. It's because <clears throat> the studies demonstrate that if you do this, uh, patient health improves. <clears throat> if you're going to have evidence-based medicine, you need evidence-based software to fit with it. And the only way that software can be evidence-based is if it's completely open to scrutiny. Anybody can go in and look at it and see whether it does what it says it does. Uh, closed source can't do that. What surprises have you encountered <laughs> with respect to this stuff? Or your work <clears throat> with this stuff? Wow. Or what has delighted you about working with this? Surprise and delight, not necessarily the same. Oh, they're, they're both interesting questions, though. Um, I feel like my career is an endless series of surprises and delights. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm constantly learning new things. I'm always amazed by um, the ingenuity of the users. You know, one, once they get over their fear of giving feedback, once they get over the, the training they've been given that you shut up and you just accept the software, because, I mean, what can you tell Microsoft about Microsoft Word? You know, I mean, you can send in the little form and then you crickets, you never hear anything again. Um, so they get trained not to talk. But if you can break through that and get them to understand that, no, this is your software. I don't mean change management your as in ours and I want you to feel ownership. It's yours. If something's broken, it's your fault because you didn't make us fix it and we want to fix it. So what happens is, a, is a astonishing. I mean, I, people will go from sort of beaten down and depressed and resentful to you know, Seattle VA still has some of the most wildly cheerful, optimistic, over-the-top application coordinators I've ever met. Uh, even under the current regime where they don't, they don't get to 
to make changes anywhere. They don't get to have the software fit them. But they remember what it was like, and they have this big spark of life inside them. And uh, their, their creativity is, is boundless. I'm also, most recently, the things that surprise me the most are, you know, we have this Paideia program to train up a new generation of, of Vista programmers. We think that's the key to the Renaissance. And um, our initial classes were <coughs> clumsy, manual, hand-driven affairs of me just you know, trying to help these guys to learn. But um, even so, some of, these, some of these young programmers have, have gone in to do astonishing things in just a short time. I mean, George Lilly's work with, with e-prescribing and Vistacom and, and all of these cutting edge applications that, are, that run on mobile devices. And you know, this is, a, this is a revolution for Vista. And he didn't write a line of months code three years ago. I mean, you know, he just, we just taught it to him and he's gone on to, to do these things. So, you know, uh, it amazes me. It astonishes me. Um, Probably not what you were expecting me to say, Absolutely. but. Um, Why do you think a new generation of programmers are interested in MOS, right? Because it's old, and it's last century's technology. Yes. And so where are these new people coming from? Yes. Well, there are several things. Um, <clears throat> Let's, let's, take it, let's take it in two parts. The first part is this. Um, when I worked at the, for, the, for the San Francisco Information Systems Center, one of the seven national offices that did development uh, on the Vista software, uh, about halfway through my, my tenure there, we, we got in a, a young programmer named Vadim Dubinsky. <coughs> and he was helping us with, um, we had this new broker software that would allow um, user interfaces, clients written in Delphi or Visual Basic or C++, C++ to, to connect to the Mumps backend. So the broker was an important piece of software. He was following in the footsteps of the guys before him who had, who had got it going. And he worked at it. And he was you know, good-natured and enthusiastic. But when the reorg started, <coughs> and they started to take away the permission of the developers to work on anything the users asked for, when they started to say, well, no, just sit there and wait and submit papers asking for permission to make changes, he got demoralized and he left for the private sector. When he, when he got a private sector job, he was snapped up inside of a month. He, uh, his salary was double, and uh, he was given all kinds of authority. But a year later, he was back at the VA. And the reason he came back, he, he had to cut his salary in half to do that. He said the reason he came back was <clears throat> nothing he, re he did mattered. He, he made twice the salary, but it made no, you know, software would end up on a shelf, or it would be maybe for a game, or, you know. But before that, he was busy saving lives. <laughs> and it's, it's, to be able to make a difference turns out to be a burning need for human beings, whether they realize it or not. And with Vista, every fix you make, every improvement you make is multiplied by hundreds of thousands of users who are going to apply it in their medicine every day. That is, there are a few places in life in this modern, huge, bureaucratic world where you can really make a difference like that. That feeds something people need. Um, now for the other reason. <coughs> The other reason is that although marketing will tell you that old is bad and new is good, it's not true at all. Our artificial intelligence goes back to the 60s, right? AI, you know, the cutting edge, robotics, and 60s, 1960s. Um, object orientation, Simula 1967, that's where it begins. OO is, <coughs> is the dominant paradigm for how to organize software, but it's not new. Even relational technology, which has tried to push its newness and freshness, goes back to the early 70s. Uh, you know, in no other area of science do we pretend that it's a good thing if we overthrow all of our fundamental principles. In in ge you know, when we're studying physics, we don't say we've just discovered today that gravity makes things fly away from the center of the Earth. Yay! You know, it's like, no. We, you know, what you're looking for is to, is to add to a legacy um, of established truths and, and reliable information to, to stand on the shoulders of giants and reach on to the next thing. And uh, MOMS has been under a, a state of constant evolution since the 60s. It's evolved right up through the most recent standard, which was the 95 standard. All the vendors have continued to extend it since then. And there's a new MUMP standard coming. We've re reformed the MUMPS Development Committee, and there's going to be a 2012 standard. So what's new, what's old, doesn't really matter nearly as much as does this give you the language you need to express the algorithms and data structures that you're going to use to save people's lives? And it does, which is why, which is why most medical software is written in MUMPS. It is the only major programming language specifically designed for medicine. Do you have any other great stories you'd like to share? Oh my god, this community is crawling with stories. We're a bunch of gossips. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, 
one hardly knows where to start except to say, you know, maybe if we, <coughs> maybe if we find ways to work together on an ongoing Vista history project, hypothetically speaking, uh, I will be able to uh, plug you in with a lot of the people who have the, who have the stories to tell. Oh boy. I mean, besides starting by opening a box. And <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Ta-da! I, 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 I did enjoy that, yeah. Uh, mm. How about this? Um, in 2001, we, we'd, we'd um, oh, World Vista, the Vista Expertise Network, where did all this come from? This is a story. So we, I mentioned that we recently re, we were going to have come out with a new MUMPS standard, and we recently reformed the MUMPS Development Committee. The MUMPS Development Committee closed its doors for administrative reasons in 1999. They didn't have, they got into a voting trap. Right? They didn't have enough people to vote to meet, even to disband. So in the early 2000s, they wanted to disband, they wanted to disband and they couldn't because they were stuck. But uh, we've changed our mind and we're, we're reforming it. Well, in the year leading up to that, uh, we were, looking to add object-oriented technology to MUMPS. We wanted to move MUMPS to the next. I mean, we knew OO was, was the thing. It's, it's, it's the best way to organize complex software. And uh, we formed a subcommittee, and the subcommittee formed a task group. The task group formed a little working group. So this little informal working group of people kept meeting over and over every year. Outside of the MUMPS Development Committee meetings, I was on that working group. And um, <clears throat> so was David Witten, Chris Richardson, Larry Landis, Art Smith, Chuck Link, and a few others. We would get together, at, you know, on the Queen Mary or in a hotel in Birmingham or wherever we could find four times a year and get together and sit down with the cutting edge of OO and say, okay, so what's new in OO and what does MUMPS do and how do we reconcile these things and get them together? So we were designing a language we were calling Omega. It was going to be a second generation MUMPS. It would, it would interoperate with MUMPS, it would be compatible with MUMPS, but it would have this amazing new stuff. Well, this amazing old stuff from the 60s, but this amazing powerful stuff. But we began to notice that... Um, the, uh, um, you know, the stuff in the VA, the, the, the centralization, the cutting out the users from the process, it was just getting critical. And there, there was all this um, slander going around. There was all this discussion of how, uh, you know, MUMPS is old technology, you can't actually do anything with it, there's no point in investing in it, and besides, you know, it's, it's pointless. And, and the big one they had at the moment is, we have to get out of MUMPS because there's only one MUMPS vendor. Well, we know that wasn't true. I mean, there was GTM right there. And we would have these arguments in the VA and say, why are you saying there's only one, one month vendor? In fact, there's like four of them, and I could, I could list them all and name them. And they didn't care. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't run any of those. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> so we were sitting around after dinner at one of these um, Omega working group meetings, and we had this discussion in which we realized that, you know, people aren't even adequately using the existing object oriented technology. This new cutting edge, just bleeding edge, amazing thing that we were designing, they weren't going to get that either. They, were really, they weren't ready for it. And, we, and, and, and to underscore our point, we said, yeah, I mean, people don't, it's like, it's like we're trying to build, you know, the USS Enterprise. Nobody needs that. They'd like to have their water running. You know, it's, it's what people need right now is, is to know that, that the Vista they have is actually functional and to be able to develop with it. They need proof that it's still productive. And, and, and they need to know that, that Mumps isn't dead. There's multiple Mumps vendors. Said, you know, the only thing really stopping them is that nobody's ported Vista to run on GTM. And, you know, and I looked around the room and there were several of us who had done all of the porting of Vista onto the previous platforms. And I said, I mean, we could port Vista to run on GTM. And we all looked at each other and said, I mean, really? We don't have to ask for permission. We don't have to wait for the VA. We could just do it. And if we did it, it would prove that, you know, there are other MUPS implementations, that Vista can run on them, that Vista development is still possible. But really, there's nothing stopping us. And the more we thought about it, the more we realized, why are we working on this far out there future cutting edge thing that you know, eventually might benefit somebody when there's this big immediate problem that we could easily solve right in our hands? So we decided, we voted at that meeting to, um, to shelve our work on the cutting edge object oriented stuff and to start meeting to port Vista to run on GTM. And those porting parties, which replaced the OO parties and began happening four times a year, were the, were the beginnings of World Vista. We incorporated coming out of those meetings as a direct result. So World Vista started as a working group, of a task group of a subcommittee of the most development committee. <laughs> Weird. It's, 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 it's like accidentally walking into the VA the day they happen to be shipped a computer. The, the, the way that history actually manifests is never the way we expect it to. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome.